Hello everyone, my name is Maxime Planson and uh, in this video I will be presenting the paper entitled Exact Lattice Sampling from Mount Gaussian Distributions, which is a joint work with Thomas Prest. Uh, okay, let's begin. So yeah, we're interested in the following problem. We want, uh, we're given a description of a lattice, which you can think of as a basis, and we want to sample from a distribution D whose support is a subset of the lattice L that is independent of the basis. So for an algorithm to be a good solution to this problem, we also require that it's possible to sample from a narrow distribution with respect to the input description of the lattice. Second, we uh, want it to be possible to shift the distribution by any chosen target vector in the space. Okay, so there are already uh, lattice samplers, the two main one being GPV, also known as Klein sampler, and the second one being PyCard sampler. So both of these algorithms, they sample from the discrete Gaussian distribution with an expected norm of the output being about root n times some value that represents that represents the length of the basis that you use. Uh, I won't go into the detail about what length of the basis means, but it's written on the slides if you're interested. Uh, okay, so the discrete Gaussian distribution I just mentioned is defined as the discretization of the usual Gaussian distribution where the discretization process is as follows. So you have a distribution D of density F over Rn and the discretization of D over L is defined uh, as follows. So its density is uh, the restriction of F normalized on the lattice. Okay, so now why uh, this problem? Well, sampling distributions on lattices is a useful tool for many constructions in lattice cryptography. So you have here a short list of applications of uh, such algorithms. Okay, so now it's not always mandatory to have the sample distribution to be Gaussian for the applications in cryptography. And Gaussians come with a fair share of problems uh, regarding implementation and so on. So we think that it could be interesting to have various distributions and various techniques to sample of our lattices, and this is the point of the framework that we have constructed. Uh, okay, um, and just for example, Gaussians, they're suited to Euclidean norm, but one may need to sample from a distribution that's suitable to the L1 norm, the L infinity norm, and that's where our framework can become really useful. Okay, so the question is, can we sample efficiently from fairly narrow non-Gaussian distributions on lattices? And the answer is pretty much yes, depending on, on your definition of efficient and fairly narrow. Uh, so basically our framework uh, offers a trade-off between time and width of the sample distribution, and you can somewhat have both, uh, meaning both efficiency and a distribution that's quite concentrated on the target, but I'll come back to that uh, later. Okay. So just a quick note on the round of algorithm, since it will play an important role for the exposition of our techniques. Uh, so the algorithms, the algorithm, algorithm sorry, works as follows. It takes as input a basis B in a vector X. Um, and you wanna, you wanna compute a lattice point that is close to X. So first you compute Y, it's coordinates, the coordinates of X in the basis B, then you round them and you return the lattice point that corresponds to these coordinates in the basis B. Okay, so now geometrically, uh, this algorithm can be seen as follows. So the algorithm splits the space Rn into a tessellation, as shown in the picture, uh, made of parallel pipettes spanned by the basis B. And if you want to compute the round off of some vector x, then you return the unique lattice point that is within the same parallel pipette as x. And so, as you can see, the pre-image of any lattice point is the parallel pipette surrounding it, uh, which will be important in the following. Okay, so now uh, this is where I move on to uh, describing what is the ID behind our framework. So I will use the simplest instantiation uh, that we have, which is using the round of algorithm to sample uniform distribution of our hypercube. Uh, so first, I'll start with a quote from uh, GPV, where the authors describe a strategy that has been used um, to sample discrete Gaussians. So the strategy goes as follows. Um, if you want to sample from the discrete Gaussian, you first sample from the continuous, uh, the usual continuous Gaussian, and then you round these samples to the lattice. 
uh, using the roundup algorithm and you get some distribution defined on the lattice. Um, so they mentioned and they explained that if one wants the output distribution to be close to the discrete Gaussian, then you have to take a somewhat large standard deviation. And yeah, this is because this procedure samples from the so-called rounded Gaussian and it's different from the discrete Gaussian that we were we are actually aiming for and increasing the parameters uh, decreases the error. Increasing the standard deviation decreases the error and therefore asymptotically somehow it's working. Not, not so well for Gaussian distributions. So now let's see what happens if we use this exact method to sample from the uniform distribution on the lattice uh, restricted to a hypercube. So yeah, this is uh, what we want to do is to use this method to sample uniform distribution over the big black dots here in the example in dimension two. Um, okay, so let's try the naive adaptation of this method. So first we sample from the continuous uniform distribution over the hypercube here of radius r. Uh, then we round the samples and now we get a picture like this where the support of the distribution we get is the big black dots. So as you can see, uh, there are black dots outside of the hypercube and this is because a uh, point will have a non-zero probability whenever its parallel pipette, the parallel pipette surrounding it, is intersecting the hypercube. So yeah, we see that there are two problems arising. The first one, which I'll call the green dot problem, is that the green dot here on the picture on the right is outside of the support of the distribution we want to sample but it has a non-zero probability because its parallel pipette is intersecting the hypercube and therefore it has non-zero probability but it shouldn't so yeah this is the first problem and the second problem is what i will call the blue dot problem where the blue dot is uh is uh is is not getting uh the same probability as the black dots within the hypercube because the probability of the blue dot is a probability that some point is sampled within the, its center parallel pipette, but the intersection of this parallel pipette and the red hypercube is not uh, full. It's, the, the parallel pipette is not a subset of this hypercube, and therefore its probability is going to be lower than the probability of the black dots for which the parallel pipette is completely a subset of the hypercube. And so this is not going to be uniform. And so this is not going to be the distribution we are aiming for. Okay, so we bring two modifications to tackle these two side effects. Um, so it's pretty much one to one since uh, the solutions we have do not interfere much. Uh, so yeah, the first thing we do is we sample uh, the, the we, we are aiming for the the uniform distribution in the red hypercube and we sample in the blue hypercube on the picture on the left which is a little bit wider and this is so the blue dot uh, from the last picture has its parallel pipette completely within the continuous uh, support uh, okay now we run the samples just like before and we see that there are a lot of green dot problems around there because there's a lot of points outside of the red hypercube that are uh, black, big black dots. Uh, and so what we do is we just discard them. This is uh, the last step, the rejection sampling. Uh, since they should have zero probability, we just discard them and that's it. Now, as you can see, the support of the distribution is therefore the lattice intersected with the red hypercube and, um, and all of these points, their probability is the probability that uh, the continuous sample was in the parallel pipette uh, around this lattice point and therefore they all have the same and it's uniform and it's the distribution we wanted. Okay, so now about the framework uh, based on this example, uh, the, the contribution of this framework is uh, to generalize the, the previous process uh, on two components. The first one being the rounding operation where we use the round of algorithm and the second one being the target distribution. Okay, so first the rounding operation, how do we generalize it? 
we introduce the following definition of regular algorithm. So we say that some algorithm A is regular when A of X plus Y is A of X plus Y, Y outside of the argument, if Y is the last point. So uh, you may recognize that the round of algorithm is a regular algorithm, and there are other examples such as the nearest plane algorithm and any exact TDP solver. So why, why did this definition? It's because we have the following uh, interesting property uh, for L regular algorithms. Um, that is, if you define T to be uh, the pre-image of zero by this algorithm, and you take all the translations by lattice points of this style, then you get a periodic tessellation of the space. Uh, so I'll just uh, take an example. If you take the round off, uh, T is going to be the center of parallel pipette spanned by the basis, and uh, its translations is going to give the first picture here. Uh, and so this covers the whole space, and there's no intersection between the parallel pipettes, therefore it's tessellation. Uh, okay. Now the second picture is the tessellation induced by the nearest plane algorithm, and the third picture is the tessellation induced by any exact TDP solver, so known as the Voronoi uh, tessellation. Okay, so this is what we wanted from the, the rounding process for the first component, and now we move on to the second component, which is the target distribution. So we'll deal with the density of uh, the target distribution by introducing square monic functions. Okay, so we're given a prototype T, uh, and a function omega in Rn from omega in Rn to R. And we say that uh, this function f is t square monic if when, uh, for all x for which this equation will make sense, we have that the mean value of f over t plus x is f of x. So in particular, if you take x is zero, the mean value of f over t is going to be f of zero, and this should be true for any translation of, uh, of t. Okay, so yeah, this may remind the definition of harmonic function where uh, harmonic functions are supposed to verify the mean value property over L2 balls for any center, any radius, and yeah. Okay, I'll just move on to uh, an illustration of square monicity, what it means geometrically. So, okay, you have here two pictures of graphs of square monic functions. And as you can see, um, there the blue dot is laying on the graph of the function and it takes a specific, okay, so the, the X and Y coordinates of the blue dot uh, is, uh, is uh, invariant of the tile, where the tile is the red square. So the, the mean value of the function over the red square is the z component of the blue dot. And wherever you move around the red square, it's always going to be uh, the value of the, the mean value of the function on this tile is always going to be uh, the z component of the blue dot. Okay. Um, so now uh, I move on to uh, some examples of uh, square monic functions. So first we have this very interesting property that follows from the linearity of the integral where the set of square monic functions for a given prototype t is a vector space and this will be useful. Um, so examples. The first example is quite trivial, it's a constant function since the mean value of a constant is a constant and the, the value in a specific point is always constant. So yeah, this is quite a trivial example, but it, it, it means that uh, uniform distributions are square monic. And this is the example I gave uh, in the beginning. So yeah, um, now I'll move on to the next example where we have linear forms that are t square monic uh, for any symmetrical tile, uh, which geometrically makes sense since its graph is a hyperplane. And if you take the mean value over uh, a symmetrical tile, it's going to be the, the value in the middle of the tile. And therefore, uh, this is going to be square monic. Okay. And as it's a vector space, you can add uh, a linear form and a constant function and you get the density of what we call a find 
of what we call a fine distributions. Okay, the next two examples are not uh, really geometrically uh, meaningful. So I'll just summarize. We have four types of distributions that are squamonic, uh, the constant uh, functions, which give uniform, the affine distributions, affine product distribution, and exponential distributions. Okay. Um, so now I move on to describing the framework, probably properly speaking. So we have a lattice L, an algorithm A, a description tau of L, um, uh, yeah, a distribution D of density F defined on a support omega prime, omega subset of omega prime, and finally we have a target vector C in space. Okay, so the sampling goes as follows. Uh, first, you sample from the continuous distribution D, which gives you a sample Y. Then uh, you round Y plus C using uh, the algorithm A, which gives you some point X on the lattice. And then uh, there's the rejection sampling step where you reject X if X minus C is not in omega. Okay, so, and we have the following result, which is if the four conditions listed here are verified, then x follows the distribution uh, d translated by c uh, discretized on the lattice l and this is exactly what we were aiming for so yeah okay so yeah about the conditions now so the first condition basically says that you can sample from d and this is an obvious condition for the first uh, step of the sampling so okay now, the second condition is that A is L regular and it induces a dissolution of prototype T. Uh, we ask that F is T squarmonic for the third condition with T the prototype of A. And <clears throat> so together, the second and the third uh, condition, they ensure that the distribution D is such that the rounding of D, waving hands, the rounding of D is the same as the discretization of D, where rounding is taken uh, with respect to A. Uh, and so this is uh, pretty much the step where uh, discrete Gaussians didn't work out so well because uh, they don't verify these uh, things and therefore the something wasn't exact and yeah, it didn't work out so well. Okay. Now the fourth step is that, uh, the fourth condition, sorry, is that we ask for omega plus t to be a subset of omega prime. And yeah, this is um, a condition that prevents the, the blue dot problem from happening since all the points within omega, so the points that we want to sample from in the discrete, uh, in the discrete sampling, um, their tile or their polypiped in the example is within the continuous support. Okay. Um, so just a quick note about the rejection rate. So there's a lot of information here, but the main takeaway is that um, you have a drawing on the left of what the so-called acceptance volume is, and the acceptance rate is the probability of this thing for the continuous sampling. And in the example I gave in the beginning, this gives uh, something like r to the n divided by r plus the, the infinity norm of t uh, to the n. And this is going to be a constant for n proportional to uh, n and to the infinity norm of t. Infinity norm of t meaning that it's the maximum uh, infinity norm of a vector in the in t. Okay. Uh, so next slide is a table that summarizes the expected L2 norm uh, for the instantiations. So in uh, rows you have uh, regular algorithms, in columns you have uh, distributions. Um, okay, so there are a few things to notice here. So first, if you take the round-off algorithm, the, there's always going to be uh, a factor uh, S1 of B that's going to be uh, the length of the basis factor uh, for this algorithm. algorithm sorry. For the nearest plane, it's going to be uh, S1 of uh, B tilde, which is the GSO of B. Uh, and for the exact CVP, it's going to be the covering radius. Okay, uh, now um, in, 
columns very much. Uh, as you can see, all but one uh, distributions have a factor n squared in front of the, the size of the basis. And yeah, this is, um, this is much bigger than uh, the GPV uh, Klein sampler and PyCard sampler, which had a root n factor. Um, but this can somewhat be explained uh, by the fact that we measure, uh, we measure the L2 norm of distributions that are more suited to different norms. So for example, if you take the L infinity norm of the infinity uniform uh, sampling, then you would get something like n to the 1.5 times S1 of B or S1 of B tilde. And well, this is still a factor n bigger, but only a factor n uh, bigger. Okay, and uh, yeah, you would, you would get something similar for all the instantiations here, if you use the appropriate uh, norm for measuring the output. Okay, so there's a few open questions that this work leaves. Um, so first about harmonicity. So the question is given a tile T, what, what are the solutions for F for the harmonic equation? Um, so we know that for harmonic functions, uh, which verify stronger uh, hypothesis or like equation, uh, it's equivalent to uh, Laplacian of f is zero, and there's infinitely many harmonic functions, and we wonder if uh, there's infinitely many uh, solutions, infinitely many more, or like more distributions to be sampled. Uh, using this technique and yeah if we find more instant harmonic functions we find more instantiations and maybe there would be some improvement on the quality of the output uh, yeah the the other uh, thing the other open question is about the size of the output so as I said it's a main drawback of the sampler so the question is can we improve the size of the of the output, um, you could think that uh, the of many ways to improve it actually. So, for for example, what you can do is uh, when you build omega prime, you you know omega prime is just a thicker omega, and maybe you can uh, make it not as wide as we do, in which case you would lose the exact sampling trait, but you would improve. Uh, the size of the output and there may be some trade-offs like that you, you can find to improve the, the size of the output uh, at a price. Okay, so now finally to conclude, why is this framework better than client bycard sampler? It's not uh, better, but it's different uh, in a number of ways. So for example, bycard and client sampler, they, they sample from the uh, distribution that is close to the discrete Gaussian whereas we sample from uh, exactly from various non-Gaussian distributions instead. Um, yeah, and also, uh, whereas uh, the Gaussian distribution is suitable to the L2 norm, we offer uh, distributions that are suitable to uh, different uh, norms. Okay, uh, just a quick mention, there's a way rather involved to uh, sample from exactly from the discrete Gaussian, which I didn't mention before. Okay. Uh, okay. Next, um, the size of the output is a bigger than bigger uh, for our sampler than the discrete Gaussian counterparts. And finally, uh, the Klein and Packard sampler they give a precision width trade-off. So if you increase uh, if you decrease the width, you uh, decrease the precision of the sampling and we offer a runtime width trade-off instead. So you could uh, sample from a very narrow distribution where you would take uh, exponentially many time to sample. Okay, and uh, that's about it. Uh, thanks for watching and uh, bye.